I'm Aishwarya Naresh Reganti. Um, I don't tell everybody my full name because it's so long. Uh, but yeah, uh, I work for Amazon Search and uh, we build graph models for search and recommendation. Uh, pretty much all the products that you see on the Amazon website, a bunch of teams, um, including my team, builds it. So if you're seeing good recommendations, then I worked on that. If not, then it's probably some team um, across the aisle. Uh, so today I will be talking about building graph models for search and recommendation because uh, most large corporations like Amazon, Facebook, Google, etc., use graph models these days. I will quickly go over how we can represent a lot of data as graphs and how we can build graph models in order to give users the best recommendations. If you're new to the world of recommender systems, this is pretty much the uh, foundation of any recommender system. It's basically a user behavior um, data that we get. Think of you just uh, typing queries on Amazon and then clicking on a bunch of products. That's, that's pretty much the user behavior data that uh, companies use. And then there's something called the engagement corpus, which is pretty much the structured format of this user behavior that uh, is stored. This can be in the form of a graph. It can be um, you know, flat data or there's textual data, et cetera. And then we use algorithms to generate candidates for the next time users come up on the recommender system. Let's say you typed a query shoes and then a bunch of users are always clicking on um, certain products. The next time we know that this is the kind of product that the customer is interested in, but we need machine learning models in order to tell us that. Um, and once we have some candidates generated, we uh, come up with something called as recommendation scores, which is pretty much ranking these candidates um, for a particular user. And this can be uh, personalized recommendations. For instance, let's say you're always buying Nike shoes, then we know that the next time we should be ranking Nike shoes on the top, even if you typed shoes. Um, or let's say that people from a certain country are always interested in certain kinds of um, you know, products, then probably we'll have to rank them higher. So we take all these candidates and we rank them using a ranking system. And then, uh, voila, you see the final recommendations that um, uh, shows a bunch of products that you'd have to buy. In today's talk, I will be focusing on the boxed area, which is um, how do you take this user behavior, create a data set, and generate candidates. The ranking part of it is a um, you know, different beast altogether. And, um, most matured recommender systems pretty much fall into the same kind of a backbone. Um, although they have a bunch of components, you can always assign components into this kind of a you know, um, um, uh, foundation. So um, I'll quickly explain how we can uh, think of candidate generation as a graph problem with a very simple example. Um, if you see on the left, you see um, a search query. I'll be using the term query to represent whatever you type on, say, Amazon.com or uh, other e-commerce website. And then let's say we have products P1, P2, and P3 that are somehow being recommended to you. Um, you might ask, how do you even come up with these recommendations because you don't have a recommender system yet. But let's say we have this very bad recommender system that's generating random recommendations for you, but then the customer has actually clicked on products P1, P2, and P3. Um, and then we have a query Q2, and um, customers have clicked on P1, P4, and P5, et cetera. Uh, to make it sound a little more interesting, let's say Q1 is shoes, and then you have you know, um, Nike shoes, Adidas shoes, and um, Skechers, maybe. And then Q2 is probably the query Nike shoes, and then you again see Nike shoes as the top product that users click on. And maybe Q3 is Skechers, and then you again see a bunch of um, uh, products before, I mean, P6, P7, et cetera. Now, all of this can be thought of as a graph because these queries are nodes and products are also nodes. And any interaction that happens are the edges between a graph. That's pretty much what you need to create a graph, right? You need a bunch of nodes and a bunch of edges. And um, if you really observe, we can translate um, the behavior on e-commerce websites in such an elegant manner by using graphs. Um, 
And how do you generally construct the engagement corpus from this is what you see on the right. We pretty much get all of these engagements and then we connect edges between uh, products that are similar. For instance, P1 and P1 are the same uh, node here. So this sort of gives us an idea that maybe Q1 and Q2 are related because um, users are clicking on the same kind of products. So you sort of get the picture that we consume user behavior and convert it into a graph. And this is a very simple use case. What we um, do um, generally is also have, you know, buyers and sellers or even reviews and all of this is consumed as a graph. Um, and now, once we have created this graph, the idea is to use a model in order to generate candidates, which is generate recommendations. Um, in this case, given a particular query, we want to come up with the best set of products that can be, um, you know, that can engage the customer. Um, so, if you look on the right, we have a bunch of existing edges, which are products that a particular, uh, I mean, products that customers have clicked on for a particular query. And the idea is that the graph model that we're using should be able to identify future behavior in the graph. If you look at the red dotted lines, this is probably future behavior um, because um, Q1 is connected to P1, P1 is connected to Q2, so probably Q1 and Q2 are related, and um, I can recommend products P4 and P5 as well for Q1. This is, um, if you have um, studied recommended systems, this is a very simple use case of collaborative filtering where you get correlations between different nodes. Um, so the idea is I have an engagement corpus and I need to generate candidates, so I will be using a graph model which ideally should be able to generate these um, red dotted lines that we have in this picture. And that's where uh, graph neural networks come into the picture. Graph neural nets are a family of deep learning models that model non-Euclidean data, basically graphs. And what is very different about graph neural networks is that they can use neighboring information to capture task-specific information. If you've um, um, studied language models or um, uh, computer vision models, they cannot model relational data because um, uh, pretty much in, a, in an image there are not really a lot of relations. But graph neural networks model graphs or they understand representations that are in the format of graphs. So if you really think of it, if you have an input graph, think of a very random input graph and you want to get a representation for each of the node in the graph, what the graph neural network does is looks at the neighbors around that uh, node. Here for A, let's say A is our target node, B, C, and D are the first top neighbors, which is the neighbors that are directly connected to A. And then F and E are the second hop neighbors, which are, the, which are connected after two hops. Um, and we pretty much use neural networks in order to learn these representations. Um, in order to put it in a very um, simple terminology, um, if, if, if you've uh, heard of um, five people you meet in heaven, it's the kind of you, um, int you are an average of you know, the people that are around you. You pick up behaviors from them. That is sort of the basic principle that graph neural networks use, that in a graph, if there are certain nodes, they are influenced by the behavior of nodes around them. Um, that's pretty much what graph neural networks do. And the um, representation format that graph neural networks consume is also very versatile because they can um, consume um, information like um, text features or even metadata, etc. And they also look at the surrounding information. So GNNs actually make use of both the graph structure and task level features, whereas all other classes of uh, neural networks only consider task level features. There is no neighboring information that they consider. And if you really think of it, you can model any problem as a graph problem. For instance, uh, if you look at computer vision, like if you need to consume images, all neighboring pixels of a particular pixel can be considered as neighbors and can be uh, modeled using graph neural networks. If you look at sentences, you could also consider um, like neighboring words of a particular word um, as a 
graph structure and also use graph neural networks to model it. So um, um, pretty much every data that is available can be modeled as, as a graph. But depending on the application that we have and depending on how much of relational information is useful to model the problem, uh, we choose to use a graph neural network or not. Um, for any math nerds here, this is pretty much the formulation of a graph convolutional network, which is a very simple um, graph neural network. But I'll quickly skip over it, um, given the time constraint. Um, so just coming back to status quo, that is, we have an engagement corpus, we want to generate candidates, and we want to use a graph model in order to do so. Um, this task of identifying new edges in a graph is called link prediction or edge prediction. And graph neural networks can be used for a bunch of different tasks. Uh, for instance, node classification, which is, um, think of trying to identify the kind of products that are available on the Amazon catalog. Um, they, can, uh, they can fall into different categories. They can fall into beauty products, or they can fall into books or movies, etc. And if you want to identify the class of a new product that's come into the catalog, you can use node classification. Link prediction is for recommendation, like I just mentioned. You can also use graph classification, which means that you can take subsets of or clusters of nodes and try to identify what class they fall into. Um, there's also like anomaly detection, which is say we have a fraudulent user in the Amazon uh, website, how do we try and identify them and um, uh, take the necessary measures. So if you really look at it, uh, this graph structure can be used for so many downstream applications, not just recommender systems. Cool. Um, the next half of my presentation will be that we have graph models. We know they're able to model graph um, uh, problems very well. And we know that this is super useful for uh, e-commerce websites like Amazon because there are so many interactions on the daily basis. And um, the graph structure really helps capture all that information. But the problem with um, uh, you know, uh, using these graph models is it is extremely difficult to scale them. If you really think of it, Amazon uh, gets about 18 orders per second. This was a statistic probably in 2021, and it's probably increasing. And we deal with millions of data on a daily basis. So how do you actually consume so much, so much of information and train machine learning models on it? And now we have a in-house library inside of Amazon. It's called this DGL. It's also an open source library, so please feel free to check it out. The idea behind this DGL is that we partition large graphs into multiple clusters and train them on different machines. Um, the partitioning methods are called metis and parametis. You can check them out. They are very standard partitioning methods for graphs. And then we train these models using a distributed hybrid CPU GPU training. Now, if, you've, um, um, if you have a background of deep learning networks, you know that GPUs are pretty fast at uh, neural network calculations, weight matrix multiplications, but CPU are uh, very good at general tasks. And we use both of this in order to uh, scale the uh, link prediction task for um, graph neural networks. We basically use CPUs in order to sample uh, parts of graphs for training and GPUs to run the forward and backward pass. And there are two phases for graphs, one uh, for training graph neural networks. The first one is basically pre-processing, like I mentioned. Think of um, this graph that we have on the right side. We ideally cut them into multiple pieces so that they can fit into uh, our resource constraints. And then we augment node and edge features to this graph. And the, um, the features can be very task dependent. For the task that I was talking about, basically given a query, what are the products we can recommend, we generally try to use a, um, you know, metadata from the product. For instance, what's the price of the product? What is the text of that product? And what are the reviews, et cetera? Um, and we augment these features into the graph. And then we uh, set the, I mean, we pre-process the graph for uh, training. The second is the distributed training and inference phase, where you have these multiple instances. And then each of these instances also have multiple GPUs. We use CPUs to sample mini batches and update parameter, uh, to sample mini batches and update the parameter weights using GPUs. Um, 
We use something called asynchronous gradient updates, which means that at every point in time, every instance has the same copy of the model, um, so that you don't use stale uh, values of model parameters. And um, now that we have this really nice and fancy solution, you might think that we have solved it all. But the big problem with these kind of models is um, these three that are listed here. One of them is the cold start problem. Um, the second one is hub nodes, and the third one is communication overhead. I'll quickly go over each of these. Um, also, pardon me for the wrong title. It's handling nodes without neighborhoods. I double negated it with without no neighborhoods. But yeah, so the cold start issue is a very well-known issue in graph neural networks because um, think of a new query that users have never typed before. How do you generate recommendations for it? Because there is no behavior data at all. So graph neurons are known to perform very badly when uh, there is no behavior data. I mean, just think of it, there are no neighbors that a particular node can look at, so uh, estimating the behavior of a particular node that doesn't have any neighbors is very hard for graph neural networks. There are a bunch of research works that are done both inside of Amazon and uh, in the research community where um, they tend to uh, create a virtual neighborhood for a given node. Uh, this is one of the examples that you see in the picture, which is um, you take a node with its features and then create a virtual neighborhood for it. And the process of creating a virtual neighborhood involves identifying nodes which are similar to a particular node. Let's say we have seen the query Nike shoes before, but we have never seen the query Vans shoes before. But then it's easy to create a neighborhood around Vans shoes because we know that it's somehow related to Nike shoes, so maybe you can borrow or some of the information. That's pretty much what you do when you do not have any neighboring information. Um, the second problem is what we call as, call as hub nodes, which is basically nodes that have too many edges. In the case of a social network, think of maybe Kim Kardashian nodes or Tom Cruise nodes. These people have so many connections, so how do you actually um, you know, cut down their connections so that your graph model is able to consume all that information. Or let's say in the context of Amazon, a, a particular query has been, um, you know, associated with a large number of products. For instance, let's say I type furniture, then you probably have, you know, uh, one twentieth of the catalog of Amazon coming up. So how do you actually make sure that your graph model is able to consume all that information and not underfit on your data? So there are approaches uh, of sampling neighbors and reducing redundant neighbors. Um, there are multiple ways of doing this. One of them is, uh, you know, grouping hub node neighbors into different types based on how similar features are. The other one is using random walk based sampling approaches. Random walk is basically a page rank. So you identify which neighbors are most important in order to, um, you know, get uh, neighbors for your um, graph neural network. There are also methods that are called as drop edge, where you randomly remove some edges in a node in order to um, um, create a data augmenter. And the last issue I was talking about is uh, dealing with communication overhead. This is a problem extremely specific to graph neural networks because we are chunking graphs into multiple machines. So what if uh, a bunch of neighbors of a particular node are lost into another machine? Uh, we'll have to issue RPC calls or remote calls to the other machine in order to get neighbors of a particular node, and this takes a lot of time. And this DGL currently does this, so this is a challenge that we're currently trying to solve. Uh, we also use something called asynchronous gradient updates, like I mentioned before. Um, with synchronous gradient updates, you, we need to make sure that the model copy in every instance is the same, which means synchronization takes a lot of time. So if you really think of it, um, for graph neural networks, 80% of the training time goes into communicating information and not really training. So this is an active area of research that um, we are also working on, this DGL is working on, and there is also a lot of research in the academic community. But this is pretty much to tell you where the state of things are and where we could improve in the area of graph neural networks. Cool, I think I'm running out of time. That's the end of my presentation. I can probably take one question. <laughs> 